Well, good morning, everybody. Welcome to South Granville Congregational Church. I hope you're going to uh, have a great day today. It's a beautiful day out. Uh, just a couple of announcements, and then we'll get started. First of all, don't forget, next week is our 9.30 blended service with our annual meeting following. So uh, 9.30, if you're here at 9 o'clock, great. You know, you'll be early. <laughs> but uh, so uh, right after that, we will have the, uh, the uh, annual meeting, the uh, no brunch. And if you know any, I'm going to start calling people uh, probably tomorrow. Um, if you know anybody that wants an absentee ballot, because we are voting on all the positions, including me, um, if you know somebody that needs an absentee ballot, let me know, and um, I will get that to them uh, so that they can fill that out and then we'll get it back here. Uh, like deal with it and whatnot. Um, let's see, I'm going to be meeting with the, uh, see Sylvia here? No. Not yet, okay. Uh, so I'll get with that later, uh, hopefully we can meet tomorrow, I'll get a hold of Sylvia. And um, then the finance committee's meeting on Wednesday. Um, if you've got a bulletin with rocks in it or dents or a little slate coloring, when I got here on Thursday, I was, I was going to bring them in, and the box jumped all over the parking lot and blew across the parking lot. So I spent a few minutes chasing those around. Uh, Operation Christmas Child. Uh, also, if you know somebody, if you're watching online and you want uh, a shoebox, let me know and I will get you the shoebox as well. And um, let's see. I think that's it for regular announcements. And then uh, prayer uh, requests, just uh, please add Ken Whitney to uh, your prayer request. He just had surgery or is, is he having more? Pardon? Is, is Ken having more surgery? No, he's done he, for he's now. Done with the surgery. Yeah. So, Pray for healing for Ken, and uh, pray for Charlene as well, as uh, she needs surgery, and she's been holding off uh, so that they're not both down at the same time. And pray for Lila Meyer. Lila, Lila's had one surgery. She has another one on Wednesday. Uh, she says she's doing well, but we still want to pray for her. Uh, any other praise or prayer requests today? Yes, John. Yes. Uh, How about, hold on, John. John, I'm going to hold on, John. How about uh, pray for pray for my family to break break my 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 nephew to stay in school. Yeah. Okay. Yes, John. I uh, pray for family to family pass away this last week.
Yes, you shine Out of the ashes we rise There's no one like you None like you Our God is greater Our God is stronger God, you are higher than any other Our God is healer Awesome and power
2, verses 12 through 17. Revelation 2, 12 through 17. And to the angel of the church in Pergamum write, the words of him who has the sharp two-edged sword, I know where you dwell, where Satan's throne is, yet you hold fast my name, and you did not deny my faith. Even in the days of Antipas, my faithful witness, who was killed among you, where Satan dwells. But I have a few things against you. You have some there who hold the teachings of Balaam, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the sons of Israel, so that they might eat food sacrificed to idols and practice sexual immorality. So also you have some who hold the teachings of the Nicolaitans. Therefore repent. If not, I will come to you soon and war against them with the sword of my mouth. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who conquers, I will give some of the hidden manna, and I will give him a white stone and a new name written on the stone that no one knows except the one who receives it. Amen. 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 Shower us with holy manna, Lord. Shower us from above. We gather here to sing Hosanna. We gather to share your love. Lord, shower us with holy manna, Lord. Shower us from above. We gather here to sing Hosanna. We gather to share your love. Peace on earth and 
goodwill among all people. When we lose sight of a vision for life on earth that is established on a foundation of mutual respect and kindness, fill us with your love and strengthen us to be ambassadors of your mercy. Father, this morning we pray for those on our prayer list. We pray for those in the secret places of our hearts. We pray for our president and the first lady this morning and all those who have COVID. We pray for the hearts and souls of all those who would be so full of hatred as to laugh and celebrate and wish them dead. Your word says to love our neighbors ourselves, to love even our enemies. We don't have to like them, Lord, but put it on our hearts to love them. Lord, sometimes we stand in need of prayer. Sometimes we feel like we're drowning in a sea of trouble and we want to ask, why me? Our 24-7 access to world news seems to feed us nothing but news of suffering, abuse, conflict, and grief. When the world feels like it is going mad, please reassure us that we are in your hands. Father, remind us this morning that all are welcome here in your house, no matter where we come from, regardless of our financial status or our race or ethnicity, we're all welcome, no matter what our differences are politically. Your son died for all. We do not serve an unknown God, but you came down and made yourself known to us. You became one of us. You died for us so that we could have eternal life and spend eternity with you. So thank you, Lord, for your incredible love, mercy, and grace. And as we continue our worship this morning, we pray that everything we say and think and do is pleasing in your sight. We pray this in the matchless name of Jesus. Well, today we're continuing our series on the seven letters to the seven churches and the book of Revelation. And so far we've looked at Ephesus and Smyrna. And so this morning in part three, we're going to be looking at the church of uh, the letter that Jesus wrote to the church of Pergamum or Pergamos, depending on which uh, English translation you're looking at. Uh, sometimes there are words or concepts that can be either good or bad depending on the con context. For example, uh, the word negative, it can mean something good. Like, uh, I tested negative for COVID-19, right? Or it could be something bad, like the rating on his singing was negative, right? Uh, here's another one, fat. His wallet is fat. That's good, right? Uh, he is really fat. Not P-H-A-T, but F-A-T. That's not so good. Okay? Does this dress make me look fat? Now, that, that depends on your answer. Okay? Uh, could be good, could be bad. So, men, choose wisely. Okay? Compromise. My wife and I had a disagreement the other day, so we compromised. That's good, right? But compromising can be bad, too. And that's what we're going to look at today. Growing up, I lived on a hill just above the confluence of the Sacandaga and Hudson Rivers uh, in Lake Luzerne. And there were times, especially in the spring, when uh, Bay Road would flood. The river would get really high and it would flood. And even the houses would sometimes get flooded out. And just above the Sacandaga River is the Conklinville Dam. Uh, inspectors have to check that regularly to make sure that the integrity of the dam is not compromised because if that dam ever broke then it would be disastrous for the towns of Hadley and Luzerne and probably Corinth as well. Uh, there would be a large amount of death and destruction. And that's what was happening at the church in Pergamum. Its integrity was being compromised and Jesus as its inspector wanted to prevent them from failing. He wants to prevent us from failing. So he tells them what they need to do to get back on the right track. And this also serves as a warning for us. So let me start by giving you a little bit of background uh, on Pergamum. Pergamum lies some 65 miles north of Smyrna and about 15 miles from the Aegean Sea. And it was considered the greatest city in Asia Minor. 
Its name is where we get the English word parchment from. Uh, and this is due to the fact that it housed a massive library that contained over 200,000 parchment scrolls. But that's not its claim to fame. Uh, Pergamum was a religious center which housed temples to many different gods, some of which included Zeus, uh, Athena, and Asclepios, who was the god of healing and whose symbol you may recognize up there on the screen. Keep going. One more. There we go. Anybody recognize those symbols? Okay. After the Romans conquered Pergamum, uh, they built a temple in 129 B.C., which is later dedicated to Augustus in Rome and introduced the worship of Caesar. As a matter of fact, Caesar became their main god. Uh, it was the first Roman administrative center in the province of Asia, and the proconsul who had his residence there held the power of the sword to determine whether a person should live or die, which did not make that easy for uh, Christians who were persecuted daily uh, for their refusal to worship the emperor. They, they were one of the few places that actually had the um, privilege of capital punishment. And so, um, you know, and, and then to top that off, like with Smyrna last week, uh, they were also being uh, pressured and facing uh, pressure from the pagans around them. So if they refused to accept an invitation to a feast in honor of a pagan deity, uh, they, could not, they would not only be shunned, they could lose their businesses, they could lose their jobs. People would call them outcasts, not fit to live on this earth. You know, the deplorables of the day. Uh, Jesus writes to them in Revelation 2.12, And to the angel of the church in Pergamum write, the words of him who has the sharp two-edged sword. Now just like last week, and really in every letter that Jesus sends through John, uh, Jesus chose His words very deliberately. Pergamum was one of the very few cities, as I said, who could impose capital punishment. And that's symbolized by a sword, which was the symbol of Roman justice. The church is reminded that Jesus bears a sword too uh, and has a much greater power. It's Jesus not persecuting Roman officials who is the true judge. The ultimate power belongs to who? Belongs to God, right? And nothing the pagans can do will change that. Uh, and it's a two-edged sword. One edge of the sword proclaims the law of God and the necessity of living a holy life and a righteous life or else face judgment and utter destruction, while the other edge of the sword proclaims God's love and grace and deliverance from that judgment. The sword is the very Word of God which cuts deep into the heart of any who hear it. This is the same Jesus writing this letter who is going to return possibly someday very soon. Now later in Revelation, we are given this description. And of all the translations that I use, I love actually the New King James uh, translation of this particular set, uh, verses. I don't know why, I guess sometimes you just um, connect with a particular translation. And, and I love the way this reads. Just like David said, uh, I love your law. I meditated on it all day long. Um, I love this passage, but listen to this description from Revelation 19, verses 11 to 15. Then I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. And he who sat on him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes were like a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. He had a name written that no one knew except himself. He was clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. Now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, that with it he should strike the nations. And he himself will rule them with a rod of iron. He himself treads the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. This is who's speaking to the church at Pergamum. This is who is speaking to us. Revelation 2.13, Jesus continues and says, I know where you dwell, where Satan's throne is. 
Yet you hold fast my name, and you did not deny my faith even in the days of Antipas, my faithful witness, who was killed among you where Satan dwells. This is Jesus' commendation to the church of Pergamum. He says, look, I know where you live, okay, where Satan has his throne, uh, where Satan lives, where you're under all these pressures. I know all about that. Good job. Now, why was it called the place where Satan had his throne? Well, one reason might be that high on the hill in Pergamum was the temple of Zeus. Uh, and it was built to look like a throne. But many commentators believe that it's because the main god there was Caesar. And it was a Roman seat of authority. It also, quite simply put, was a pagan hotspot. It was like the Las Vegas of uh, Asia Minor. Uh, and despite that, and the fact that the church received heavy persecution, even to the point of martyrdom, like with Antipas, the believers had kept their faith. Now, the church at Pergamum seems to be strong in the face of opposition. It appears to be healthy, at least superficially. But whether it truly is or not, I think we uh, will have to see in just a moment. I also think we have some things in common with per Pergamum. Uh, we love God and we love people. We love our neighbors. Pergamum uh, loved God and they loved people. Uh, but they had blind spots. And I think we have blind spots. The folks at Pergamum thought they were doing everything really well. Um, and, and of course, you know, I think we think we're doing everything really well. I think we think we're one of the best churches in the area. And I hope we think that. But, you know, we would be surprised if we heard some criticism, wouldn't we? And, and I do believe we're doing really well, but we're not perfect. And neither was the church at Pergamum. They're about to get what a renowned church health expert, Dr. Paul Borden, calls uh, gulp factors. Okay, Pergamum is being compromised. Verses 14 to 15 says, But I have a few things against you. <laughs> I mean, it's not like Ephesus where it's, I have this against you, like one thing. No, I have a few things against you. Okay, uh, You have some there who hold to the teachings of Balaam, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the sons of Israel so that they might eat food sacrificed to idols and practice sexual immorality. So also you have some who hold the teachings of the Nicolaitans. Oh no, not the Nicolaitans. Remember we talked about them last week. Uh, this is not good. So we have some church members who hold to different teachings and doctrines within the church. The teachings of Balaam and the teachings of uh, the Nicolaitans, which were similar, uh, very similar. They, they both taught the Israelites to worship pagan idols. Basically, they said it was okay to eat the food that was offered to those false gods and idols. Um, and they promoted sexual promiscuity, adultery, um, uh, even to the point of orgies, and all in the name of fertility rituals and religious ceremonies. There was also spiritual adultery that occurred by calling Caesar Lord or participating in other pagan worship. And so you have these members within the church that are doing these things, participating these, in these things, and other church members know that they're doing these things, and they don't say anything. And they don't do anything. They just tolerate it. We're going to do, you know, let them go in the name of tolerance, right? The intent of both the followers of Balaam and the Nicolaitans is to deceive God's people by persuading them to adopt a lifestyle that would allow them to be accepted into the culture of the day, into the world, but continue membership in the church. Okay, Pastor Rick, that's great, but how does that apply to us? Okay, um, Well, what is our goal here in this church? What is our mission? It's to spread the good news of the Gospel and to grow the Kingdom of God, right? And so as we fulfill our mission, we are going to have all kinds of people walk through those doors and come in here who have all kinds of backgrounds, who have been exposed to all different kinds of teachings, and as you talk and interact with them, they may have questions, or they may say, well, I've always been taught this. And they might even quote from the Bible. You know, the Bible says, 
How can you call yourself a Christian if you don't live in tolerance of X, Y, or Z? See, you and I are exposed to all kinds of false teachings and pressures from the culture and the world we live in today to conform to this world and this culture. Loved ones, there are a lot of false teachers out there. And as Jesus' return draws nearer, uh, the enemy is ramping things up to try to deceive as many as he can before Jesus returns. Uh, so, what are we facing today? Well, let's start with some easy ones. And I, I'm going to tell you right up front, I cut like 20 minutes out of this message. So, if you want the full transcript, uh, I can give it to you because there is a lot more than what I'm going to give you right now. Um, but I'll start off with the easy one. If anybody sets a date and time that Jesus is going to return, just run, okay? Um, they're giving you a false teaching. If somebody says they know when the rapture is going to occur, just run. Go the other way. Harold Camping was a good example. He, he's passed now, but he did it three different times. Three different times, Okay? Matthew 24, 36 clearly says, and this is Jesus speaking, no one knows about that day or hour, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. Loved ones, no one means no one. I know you love me for my deep theological insights, right? Not the angels in heaven. Not even Jesus Himself when He was on this earth. I'm sure He knows now, but He didn't know then. Only the Father. Jesus said He's coming like a thief in the night. And that doesn't mean He's coming at night. Okay, As a former law enforcement officer, I can tell you many, many burglaries happen during daylight hours. Okay, Your best bet is plan that you're going to be here for the next hundred years, but live like Jesus is coming today. Okay, If you see someone setting a date, run. Uh, next is the Emergent Church. I don't know if you've heard of the Emergent Church. It was a, a group of pastors who were trying to combat postmodernism. And uh, frankly, they went off the rails. But out of that comes an author and megachurch pastor, Rob Bell, uh, who teaches a form of universalism. He says that God is a God of love, but He does not believe in hell. He kind of uh, believes in like a purgatory type idea. Um, God will save everyone eventually who after spending long enough time in this purgatory area, this quote-unquote hell that the Bible talks about, they'll cry out for Him for forgiveness and mercy and He'll grant it. But the Bible is explicitly clear on this. Uh, Yes, God is a God of love. God is love. But He's also holy and righteous and just. Uh, You only have this life to accept Christ. Uh, as your Savior. If you die and you go to hell, uh, it's too late. Uh, The Bible says there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth in hell. And you know what that is? A lot of that is, I missed my chance. Why didn't, you know, why God didn't you make yourself more clear to me? Well, I think God's made himself pretty clear. Um, You go to hell, it's too late. Jesus is going to say, depart from me, I never knew you. Now, if you want to know more about this, of course, you can go on our website or YouTube channel and, and, and watch the, the sermons on heaven and hell again. But one of the biggest false teachings out there today is the prosperity gospel. And I mentioned that a little bit last week. Uh, it teaches that God created us for the purpose of blessing us and prospering us in all the areas of our life, including our health, our relationships, and our finances. Now, it sounds biblical, but not the way these people teach it. Uh, some uh, preachers like Crafalo Dollar, uh, T.D. Jakes, and Joel Osteen uh, take it to the extreme. They take it to the point where it's dangerous. Now, I'm going to talk about Joel Osteen specifically this morning, and I, I have a lot more on Joel than I'm going to get into today, but Joel is the pastor of Lakewood Church in Houston, Texas, one of the biggest churches in America Uh, He has the most watched religious television show in the world with over 7 million viewers. Uh, And his ministry brings in over $80 million a year. And that does not include his book sales. I want to preface this with, uh, uh, I used to watch and listen to Joel. I used to get his emails, and devotional emails. Uh, But I noticed things which started to raise red flags for me. 
caused me to investigate him further. Uh, some of you might watch or listen to Joel right now, and, and you might love Joel and be angry with me for picking on him. Okay, but until I really looked into it, and uh, uh, you know, I, I used to think people were picking on him too uh, and being unfair. But and sometimes Joel does have some good messages, but there are some major problems with his theology. Uh, so just just keep an open mind and listen to what I have to say and make up your own mind. Do your own investigation. But I'm not going to apologize for this. Okay, Romans 16, 17 to 18 says, "I urge you." others to watch out for those who cause divisions and put obstacles in your way that are contrary to the teaching you have learned keep away from them for such people are not serving our lord christ but their own appetites by smooth talk and flattery they deceive the minds of naive people so what is so bad about joel and others like him well at lakewood church first of all there are no crosses inside or out, no religious symbols anywhere. Uh, Joel himself said to one interviewer on 60 Minutes that he thinks of himself more as a motivational speaker than a pastor, and I would agree with him. Okay, um, All of his messages are meant to be uplifting and encouraging, and there's nothing wrong with uplifting and encouraging. We need that. Okay, but Joel says he doesn't preach anything else because he doesn't want to beat people up with a baseball bat. They know they've done wrong. He doesn't preach on sin. He doesn't preach on hell. He doesn't preach on salvation. I've never heard him preach on the cross of Christ, the resurrection. Uh, I've never heard him preach on Jesus, actually. Usually it's always God or a general uh, inference to God. He doesn't preach the Gospel. Loved ones, we have to preach the whole Bible. The good, the bad, and the ugly. Sometimes we need the baseball bat. You need to know that just because you become a Christian, that doesn't mean that tragedy is not going to strike your life. As a matter of fact, God tells us we will run into problems. Last week, the letter to Smyrna. Smyrna did nothing wrong. And what was Jesus' letter to Smyrna? You're going to face persecution and trials. right? You're going to be tested. You're going to be persecuted. Now, I will give Joel some credit. He does not teach that we won't face tough times, but many of them do. The problem is that Joel only preaches that God wants you to have phenomenal health, phenomenal relationships, and phenomenal wealth. And the rest of his theology, which he doesn't preach on, uh, is severely flawed. There's a difference between God's providential will, what will happen, and God's revealed will, how He would like you to live according to His will according to his word the bible and then we also under, uh, have to understand we have free will and so we can and will mess things up right if you're going to stand up in front of people and represent god whether it's 20 people or it's 20 million people you better be able to understand and to explain god's word Tim- second timothy 4 2 to 4 says preach the word be prepared in season and out of season Correct, rebuke, and encourage with great patience and careful instruction. For the time will come when men will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths. And that is happening in a lot of churches today. There's just one more thing I want to touch on. Uh, and this will transition us to this church specifically, as in South Granville. Um, during one of uh, uh, messages that uh, Joel preached called Living in Total Victory, he quotes Ephesians 1 4. And it's up on the big screen in Lakewood, and it's on the TV, like I put the verses on the TV when I'm doing the online sermon, right? And he quotes it as Long before God laid down the earth's foundation, he had us on his mind. Because of the sacrifice Christ made, we are free people. And not just barely free, but abundantly free. Then he says, one translation says unquestionably free. The problem is, that's not what Ephesians 1-4 says. I looked it up in pretty much every English translation I could get my hands on. This is what Ephesians 1-4 actually says. And it does say, even as He chose us and Him before the foundation of the world, 
But the whole second half of the verse he made up. What's it say? That we should be holy and blameless before him in love. Has nothing to do with what he's talking about. Now, that's why you should always have your Bibles open, right? That's why we should be like the Bereans and check out what I'm teaching you, what I'm teaching you. Don't just take my word for it. Study God's word daily. Watch and then confirm what I'm teaching to you or what anyone is teaching you. If you're watching it on TV, if you're listening on Christian radio, whatever. Acts 17:11. Now the Bereans were of more noble character than the Thessalonians, for they received the message with great eagerness and examined the Scriptures every day to see if what Paul said was true. So make sure you write that down in your bulletin, Acts 17.11. Right? As I'm preaching, if I quote a Scripture that's not in the, the Scripture reading of the day, which is printed in the bulletin, write them down in your bulletin. Go look them up later. Right? I believe I'm a strong biblical teacher and not because I have a big head or a big ego, but because I know I will have to answer to Jesus. Okay, The guy with the two-edged sword. Uh, if I, and if I were to mislead you, well, Jesus said it would be better than a millstone be uh, chained to your neck and you cast in the sea and you lead one of these children astray. Have you seen a millstone? I want no part of that. All right? They're massive. And more importantly than that, I love you and I take my calling very seriously. Typically, I spend hours and hours preparing a message for each Sunday um, and studying God's Word and just preparing. But I'm also human and it's possible I could make a mistake. I think I did once. I honor wrote it on the calendar. Seriously. You need to be like the Bereans and study the Scriptures daily. And when you do, if I or someone else starts teaching something that goes against God's Word, red flags will go off. Those internal alarms. Something's not right. And it's more than just if the verse is exactly right. Okay. Now I know I've gone long on this one. Like I said, I cut out quite a bit. Um, so let me just wrap it up. Uh, Revelation 2.16 Therefore repent. Do a complete 180. Turn away from if not, I will come to you soon and war against them with the sword of my mouth. Those who are continuing to compromise, I'm coming back soon. And he's not talking about the second coming. He's saying, if you don't knock it off, I'm going to come and I'm going to take you out, essentially. I'm going to close your church. I'm going to do whatever I need to do. Um, and I don't know about you, but you know, the same Jesus that spoke the universe into existence I don't want to go to war with that sword, right? And then verse 17, He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who conquers, I will give some of the hidden manna. I will give him a white stone with a new name written on the stone that no one knows except the one who receives it. The Jews were looking for the coming of the Messianic age uh, when they would eat the hidden manna. As Christians, we've acknowledged that uh, Jesus is the Messiah, who ushered in the Messianic Age. And, and Jesus called Himself the bread of life and He contrasted Himself with the manna that the Israelites ate in the desert. Uh, this life-giving bread is indeed the Christian spiritual food and the hidden manna. It's hidden from view from the unbeliever, but it's available to all who put their faith in Jesus. Now, it also refers to the Messianic Feast of the Marriage Supper of the Lamb. Uh, at the end of this age, and it refers to the uh, eternal bliss of heaven. Now, a white stone was commonly associated with a vote of acquittal or a favorable vote. And conversely, a black stone would be an indication of guilt. A white stone sometimes was also used as a pass to, uh, like of admission to special events or occasions. So against this background, the meaning of this here refers to First of all, a reversal of the guilty verdict issued by the world's institu institutions against the overcomer because of refusal to participate in the idolatry and, and the sinful ways of the culture. Okay? And of course, a, a reversal of sin itself. where We've been found not guilty in the eyes of God because of the blood of Christ. 
As far as the new name engraved on the white stone, it's most likely the, the new name that Jesus is going to give the victorious person that they receive that no one else knows uh, and, and enables that person to take part in the Messianic banquet. Sort of like the password. You know, you knock on heaven's door, and what's the password? You drop your rock in the bucket and you're allowed in, right? Uh, and of course, God changes people's names. In the, in the Bible, he's, He did it. Uh, you had Abram who became Abraham, and Jacob who became Israel, and Simon who became Peter, right? What, what name do you think he'll give you? Let's continue to be and stay a healthy church. Let's not compromise like Pergamum. Let's study our scriptures daily like the Bereans. Amen? Amen.